Good afternoon, everybody. We're so very happy to have you all here. We're going to have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, my name is Selma Holo. I'm the director of our Fisher Museum and its Dornside International Museum Institute, the IMI, as we call it, which is presenting today this event of how 3D technologies are transforming old and new world archaeology, Rome, Tivoli, and Atsonka. Underneath the whole IMI, we have um, we have a, another institute called the the Visual Culture of the Ancient World, which is run by John Fellini, whom you all know. And John is my colleague and friend of so many years, and he's a professor of Roman art history and archaeology here at uh, at USC. I want to just tell you a tiny bit about, about again, the, the units that are presenting and researching this material. The IMI, the International Museum Institute itself, is an international think tank dedicated to fruitful discussions about the future of museums in the world at large. We've existed for about 10 years in Dornside, this is the research unit of Fisher, and had held important conferences and workshops, published books and articles, discussed issues from censorship, to management, to, uh, to, to issues around the deep research that we need to be we need to be involved in at this time in the, in the museum world, and uh, everything is in the light of the challenges and opportunities that are facing us today. Our focus of the IMI has largely been the Americas, and um, uh, from Canada all the way down to the bottom. And um, but. IMI, as I mentioned to you, has this special unit dedicated to the ancient world, both which takes in Europe and Asia and Latin America, and has a, a wider kind of scope in that way. And that's headed by John, who totally organized today's event for us. Um, participating in BCOM, again, in that unit of IMI that's dedicated to the ancient world, there are several uh, institutions in Los Angeles who, are, who participate, including uh, the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology, the University at UCLA, the Getty Research Institute at uh, the J. Paul Getty Museum, LACMA, Natural History Museum, and all of these are in one way or another linked to IMI. And one of the things that we are interested in and that John has been particularly interested in is that there is often a disconnect between museums and academia. And the mission of IMI BPA especially is to bring together those two educational spheres by promoting collaborative planning among the various museums and research units and, 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 um, and academia trying to find vital connections. Um, and those topics of interest are archaeology, comparative archaeology, cultural patrimony, and appropriation, the uses and misuses of archaeology, and we can go on. Uh, John? Uh, will uh, follow me now. He will make the appropriate introductions and he'll explain the unusual structure of the evening. I'm going to leave it in your hands, John. Please welcome John. Please. Thank you, Selma. Uh, <clears throat> but before I uh, introduce tonight's speaker, <clears throat> I would first like to thank our sponsors, namely Peter Mankel and the USC's Mellon Digital Humanities Program and the Department of Art History, as well as our Chair of Art History, Amy Ogata. For all the hard work that went into this event, I would also like to thank my colleague, Sol Mahalo, as you know, Director of the Fisher Art Museum and USC's International Museum Institute, as she mentioned. And, of course, members of her staff, Kay Allen, Ralph uh, Gatchelian, Salim Kamli, uh, and Juan Rojas. In addition, thanks a road to members of our art history staff, uh, Beth Masari, Tracy Marshall, and Anna Lee. I thank the audiovisual department of the Dornsife College, and in particular, uh, Jesse Fair, who is uh, videotaping our event this evening. And lastly, I would like to thank our guest roundtable participants, uh, Nelly Robles Garcia, uh, Chris Johansson, and uh, Justin Underhill, whom I'll introduce later on in the uh, event. So, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce an old friend and colleague, Bernard Fisher. I've known Bernie since 1975, when we were both at the American Academy in Rome, 
And more recently, I've been participating in his team project on the Augustan Solarium in Rome, which he'll discuss this evening in his talk. Bernie is a leading vi virtual archaeologist and author of seven books, three e-books, and dozens of articles on virtual heritage classics and the survival of the classical world. He is also founding editor of Digital Applications to Archaeology and Cultural Heritage, the world's first peer-reviewed online journal where scientists can publish interactive 3D models. Bernie received his BA in Classics from Wesleyan University in 1971 and his PhD in Classics from the University of Heidelberg in 1971. He taught classics at UCLA from 1976 to 2004, and from 2004 to 2013, he was professor of art history and classics at the University of Virginia. Well, since 2013, he has been professor of virtual heritage in the School of Informatics at Indiana University, where he is also director of the Virtual World Heritage Laboratory. And one of the new projects, by the way, for this uh, lab, beginning in May, is a five-year undertaking to create 3D models of all 1,250 sculptural works in the famous Uffizi Gallery in Florence. So that will be a welcome. Bernie's career has been a long and illustrious one. From 1996 to 2003, he directed the excavations of Horace's villa near Rome, and this was sponsored by the American Academy in Rome, and also one of my uh, own USC graduate students and present computer collaborators, Nick Chipola, participated in that endeavor. Well, in this same period, Bernie became founding director of UCLA's Cultural Virtual Reality Laboratory, in which he oversaw several significant modeling projects, including Rome Reborn, a virtual recreation of the city of ancient Rome, which has gained international recognition. In 2005, Bernie received the Pioneer Award of the International Society on Virtual Systems and Multimedia. In 2009, he was a recipient of the Cartesos Lifetime Achievement Prize from the Spanish Society of Virtual Archaeology. In 2010-11, Bernie also held the Senior Prize Fellowship at the Zukunftsprojekt uh, at the University of Konstanz in Germany. And in 2015, he was a fellow of the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies. His lecture this evening, How 3D Technologies Are Transforming Old and New World Archaeology, will give you a better sense of not only the range of his digital project, but also his great achievements in this important field of scholarly inquiry. So please join me, join with me now in uh, welcoming Bernie Krishna. Well, uh, thank you very much, John, for that wonderful introduction and uh, for organizing uh, this afternoon's event. And I also thank uh, Selma for, for organizing the event. Uh, I know how much work you've both put into it and you started very early on, and uh, you uh, are obsessive about all the details, <laughs> even months in advance, and you did a, a, a fantastic job, so thank you very much. It's, it's a great honor uh, to be invited to speak at the International Museum Institute's Visual Culture in the Ancient World I Initiative. So let me begin by thanking Selma and John for inviting me to present my thoughts about how 3D technologies are transforming, and let me turn on my Mike, by the way, can you hear me better now? No, you can't. <laughs> Wait, maybe uh, it was warming up. Can you hear me better now? <clears throat> I will then just try to speak loudly. Now it's okay. Okay, now it actually turned down probably. Yes, okay, there we go. So thank you for uh, inviting me to present my thoughts about how 3D technologies are transforming uh, the field of archaeology. And I also uh, want to join John in thanking the participants of the round table. And I uh, hope they'll be kind <laughs> since they're discussing what I'm about to tell you. And they've had a copy of the, uh, an earlier version of this talk for about a month. Today I will focus on some recent archaeoastronomical research 
concerning Imperial Rome, but I'd like to make it clear from the outset that the projects I will be reporting on are just the famous tip of the iceberg of the new, of the new breakthroughs that 3D technologies are making possible. So before getting down to particular applications of 3D, let me start by speaking more generally about the traditional mission of archaeology and how 3D technologies can offer new ways to support it. The mission of archaeology, like that of the humanities more generally, is usually understood to be made up of six basic activities to discover, document, preserve, analyze, interpret, and transmit evidence of the human record, particularly in the case of archaeology, the tangible part of the record consisting of art and artifacts, buildings and monuments, as well as settlements and cities. I think it is no exaggeration to begin by stating that the new 3D digital technologies that have emerged and carried all before them during my 40-year academic career have had a perceptible impact in all of these areas. This is not surprising because almost all of the objects that properly come under the purview of the archaeologist are themselves three-dimensional, even if they can differ widely in scale from an engraved gem. I say that because I see Ken LePad here, <laughs> art engraved gem expert. From an engraved gem to a city of one million, and even if sometimes at first glance they appear to be merely two-dimensional, such as a painting or a fresco. 3D technologies are thus useful because they are so nicely commensurate with the archaeological objects that we study, which thanks to 3D no longer have to be reduced on paper or in photographs to two-dimensional static views, but now can be represented just as they are with sub-millimeter accuracy and examined interactively. Thus, whereas we used to, for example, painstakingly reduce a building to a series of, two, of standard two-dimensional views on paper, like plan section and elevation, now we can set up an infinite number of views on a computer screen, and we can do so in real time. As a quick example of the advantages the new technologies afford, let us consider the stadium garden at Hadrian's Villa. In the slide you've been looking at on the screen, you see traditional 2D documentation of the complex produced by Adolf Hofmann in 1980. As an architectural historian, he understandably concentrated on the, on the buildings found there. But we also know that excavations in the 1950s turned up some fragments of the Niobid statue group of the same type as is exemplified by the best preserved example, which is in the Uffizi. On this slide, you see the fine spot, uh, the red X at number one, in number one. The arrows in number two show you the area in the Nymphaeum nearby where scholars who have studied the matter agree that the statues were probably displayed in antiquity. On the plan above, the rectangular box indicates the same area, which is adjacent to a structure known as the South Hall. Thanks to a combination of 3D technologies, we can use AutoCAD and 3D Studio Max to recreate the structures exactly as Hofmann imagined they should be reconstructed. We can use the photogrammetric software PhotoScan to model the Uffizi Niobids, and then we can pass the state models to ZBrush, a tool we use to digitally restore the statues so that, like the fragments at Hadrian's Villa, their clothing is made of dark gray bijo morato, which you can see in the Uffizi they're not, and their extremities, the skin and so on, uh, of, the, of the face and the uh, arms and the feet, are made of, of painted uh, white marble. Then we can generate any views we like of the resulting digital reconstruction. And here is a video clip with one possible fly-through, infinite number of fly-throughs one could make, of the area uh, that my lab recently made. Oops, there's the white marble.
Looking at Hofmann's drawings and our video, I think it is fair to invoke the analogy that traditional 2D archaeological documentation of the site stands to the site as it really existed in much the same relation as the score stands to the performance of a musical composition. With 3D, we can, so to speak, hear the music. And I don't mean that literally just because the video clip we just saw had a musical track. Being able to do these things means that thanks to 3D, the task of documentation has been immensely improved. The impact of 3D does not stop there, but continues across all the other five activities of the archaeologist. Let me start with an example that illustrates how 3D technologies have greatly increased our speed and efficiency in performing several traditional archaeological tasks. Then I would like to focus in more detail on the activity which, if I had to choose, uh, I think is the most important. It is the area where the quantitative change wrought by 3D can truly be said to be bringing qualitative change in its wake. I am referring to the area of analysis. Thanks to the arrival of consumer level drones that are small uh, and that are, that are very small and lightweight and the small and lightweight 4K cameras that we can mount on them such as the GoPro, we are now able to make highly detailed and precise 3D models of entire sites. As an example, I would cite the invitation received uh, last year from Dr. Nelly Robles of the Mexican government's archaeological authority to document the entire site of Atzampa near Oaxaca City in Mexico. And I'm very happy to see that Nellie's here and, and greet her and, and to know that she's on the round table. I know she'll be nice. <laughs> as, you, uh, as you can see in this uh, video clip shot from our drone, the site is located atop a hill and covers an area about 500 by 500 meters. And think of what it would have cost to get that shot a couple of years ago. Charlie knows. He probably paid the bill <laughs> bringing a helicopter and a, and a film crew. It just wouldn't have been done. The hill gave a panoramic view of the strategic point of intersection of the three major valleys making up the hinterland of the Zapotec capital at nearby Monte Alban. Occupied from roughly 600 to 850 AD, Atzompe is a late classic site inhabited by a small number of elite families. On, it, on its four terraces climbing to the top of the hill, we find two large house complexes, three ball courts, and a number of temples. I think it was either to train the ball players or to put them out to pasture in their retirement and give them something to do, but uh, it's quite amazing, just two big houses and three ball courts. A lot of temples. In the old days, you could make a 2D topo map of a site like this, but it would take you many weeks of survey in which with a total station you might collect several thousand points. What a contrast digital technology now makes. In January of 2015, two people from my lab went to Atsampa and worked for two days, just two days, collecting over 55,000 terrestrial and aerial photographs. We covered almost every square centimeter of the surface of the site and also were asked to document three burial tombs accessed from the top of one of the temples on the third terrace. Our software then processed the photographs over a six week period, making a composite site model of about one billion points. And you see the result uh, of that model on the screen, which thanks to uh, a 3D publication service, a web service called uh, Sketchfab, we actually can include, we can embed on a web page. And uh, this is just screen capture. You can go there and move around this at will, moving left, right, up, or down as you wish. So here we have the entire site. Um, of Atsampa, and it did take six weeks to process the data, but about five of those weeks were just the machine churning away. It wasn't the human operator tending the machine. That was only perhaps one week. So the amount of labor uh, involved to now is, is really minuscule, certainly compared to the result. We then returned to Oaxaca during our spring break in March 2015 and showed the results to our Mexican partners, who I hope were very happy with the results. We use the WebGL uh, solution of Sketchfab to make 3D site models like this and also uh, models of smaller objects like statues or the pottery, the funerary urns, the effigy urns that were found here, uh, accessible on the web. 
I wish there were more time to give you similar examples of how we use the new technologies in all the other activities of archaeology, but in the interest of time, what I want to concentrate on in the rest of this talk is the third area of perennial interest to archaeologists, analysis. Far be it from me to claim that the, in the, that the history of archaeology reveals any weakness in this critical area, but I do think it's fair to say that archaeology, like astronomy, has been very limited when it comes to analysis through experimentation. In the case of astronomy, the limiting factors are, of course, the distance and the scale of the objects of interest. It is hard to imagine experimenting on a star or a planet, assuming you could reach it with the right equipment and live to return to Earth to tell the tale. In the case of archaeology, the limitation is temporal. We cannot go back in time to count how many spectators could fit into the Colosseum or how long it took them to file in and out of the arena. To be sure, there is a well-established subdiscipline of the field known as experimental archaeology. But since it almost always involves experiments in the physical world, it is costly and rather limited in its scope of application. Digital technology has the potential to vastly extend the scale of experimental archaeology while dramatically lowering the costs. To return to the example of the Colosseum, imagine the cost of testing its carrying capacity or its efficiency as a people mover. Unless we could find an existing structure that more or less replicated the design of the Colosseum, and as far as I know, there is no such structure, we would have to build an expensive structure and involve hundreds, if not several thousand people, to run the necessary tests. On the other hand, with the help of a 3D model of the Colosseum, including avatars representing the spectators, we can address the old controversy about the building's seating capacity and efficiency as a people mover for a trivial amount of money. And this has actually been done, and the conclusion was that the earliest estimates of Roman archaeologists with an absurd range of, 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 uh, uh, of, of variation, that the Colosseum could hold somewhere between 35,000 and 78,000 people, was reduced to a much more precise estimate of 48,000 to 50,000 people. And the study of the circulation patterns through the buildings showed that its reputation as an e efficient people mover was somewhat undeserved since a bottleneck affecting the majority of spectators was uncovered. And by the way, that bottleneck was uncovered by Dean Abernathy, who I'm happy to greet here today, uh, who's here with his wife and his students. And he, by the way, also made this model <laughs> way back in 1999-2000. The potential of experimental virtual archaeology to use our new 3D reconstruction models as a platform for dynamic experiments is enormous and work along these lines is really just beginning. I hope to persuade you that virtual archaeology holds the promise of bringing quantitative and qualitative improvements to our understanding of the past and in making it possible to simulate phenomena that traditional experimental archaeology cannot possibly replicate in the physical world. A good case in point concerns the field of archaeoastronomy. Here the virtual approach has the major advantage over the physical. Despite appearances, the Earth's orbit is not really fixed around the sun, but changes over a 26,000 year cycle because of the precession of the equator. This means that even on the archeological as opposed to the geological, not to mention astronomical time scale, we have to take into account how the world has changed and we cannot apply astronomical observations made today to the lost world of the past. In archaeoastronomy, we have to set back not only the terrestrial clock, the monuments on the ground, but also the celestial clock, the way the features in the sky looked uh, on the ground hundreds or thousands of years ago. You obviously cannot do that physically, but you can easily do it virtually, or at least in the last two years, you have been able to do it because of the development of the open source planetary so software known as Stellarium and its 3D Sceneries plugin created by Georg Zotti of the Boltzmann Institute in Vienna. And Georg has become a very close uh, collaborator. This plugin allows you to import a terrestrial model into Stellarium, which remember is planetarium software. So its basic mission is to give you the sky uh, as, as seen at any point on Earth at any point in time. So it allows you to import a terrestrial model into Stellarium and to geo-reference it on Earth such that the 1.5 million celestial features that Stellarium presents appear as they would have done at that particular time and place on Earth. 
This is actually vast overkill, since in the northern hemisphere, a, a person with good vision cannot make out more than a couple thousand celestial features on a clear night. And Stellarium allows you to change the time on a minute by minute basis for thousands of years backwards and forwards. Thus, it is a perfect tool for virtual archaeoastronomical research, exploiting 3D reconstruction models of cultural heritage sites and monuments. I will exemplify our use of Stellarium by discussing some highlights of two recent research projects I've been pursuing uh, in recent years on the Antinoeon at Hadrian's Villa and the Meridian of Augustus in Rome. Antinous was a young man from Bithynia, so on the northern coast of, of Turkey, uh, along the, um, the Black Sea, who became Hadrian's lover in the 120s CE. In October of 130, Antinous died by drowning in the Nile while on a trip to Egypt with Hadrian. Hadrian was devastated by this loss and bestowed cult honors on his friend, founding the city of Antonopolis in Egypt and building temples all over the empire. A feature conventionally called the Antinoeon, the cult sanctuary of Antinous, is located at Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli. Discovered in 1998, the site was excavated from 2002 to 2004 under the direction of Zakaria Mari, who has been a collaborator of our project. The area uncovered was adjacent to the double road leading to the so-called vestibule or reception hall of the villa. The sanctuary had overall dimensions of about 63 by 50 meters. The perimeter was surrounded by a wall within which were discovered two identical temples, 15 by 9 meters in size, one to the northwest, the other to the southeast. They faced each other across a plaza into which were cut water channels and planters, and we know from the seeds and remains that the planters held uh, date palms, so they, it looked very Egyptian. Springing off the west side of the plaza is a large colonnaded exedra in the middle of which was another temple. For the sake of convenience, we refer to the three sh shrines as temples A, B, and C. Archaeological investigation of the site was motivated from the first to prove the theory that somewhere at Hadrian's villa, there must have been a sanctuary dedicated to his lover, Antinous. The first to propose the theory was Heinz Kehler in the 1970s, who argued that the likely spot was the Canopus, but despite various efforts, uh, including field work and excavations, no evidence was ever found in the Canopus to support Kaler's suggestion. In the early 2000s, Maori's excavations of the site, now conventionally called the Antinouan, turned up dating material placing it securely in the period after Antinous's death uh, in 130. They also uncovered many fragments of Egyptianizing sculpture, such as the ones you see in this slide. Such sculpture was obviously appropriate for the cult of a young man who drowned in the Nile and who was sometimes assimilated in his cult to Osiris. Mari also argued that the obelisk now in the Villa Borghese on the Pincian Hill in Rome came from the Antinouan. It was in the middle of those two temples, A and B, in the middle of the plaza. The inscriptions of the obelisk concern the erotology, the virtues of the new god, Antinous. Furthermore, Mari produced documentary proof that many Egyptianizing statues, such as these in the Vatican museums, were also found on land adjacent to the Antinouan, and thus, according to Mari, must have been originally erected inside the sanctuary. Mari's work in bringing to light the Antinouan appeared to have brought the search for Antinous's monument at the villa, initiated by Kaler in the 70s, to a successful conclusion. But in the 10-year period after Mari, concluded his field work. Skepticism about some of his conclusions has been expressed, most notably by the French Egyptologist Jean-Claude Grenier. Our virtual archaeoastronomical project had the goal of trying to see if there were any alignments between the celestial features and the built features of the sanctuary, and if so, to gauge their impact on the validity of Mari's interpretation of the site as an antinoeon. We took as our point of departure the fact that the sanctuary was clearly Egyptian in inspiration, cult, and decor. We therefore used as our working hypothesis the conclusions about the astronomical orientation of Egyptian temples reached by Giulio Malli in, 19, in 19, 2013 and by the Egyptian Spanish mission on Egyptian archaeoastronomy led by Juan Antonio Belmonte 
who's been a consultant to our project. By the way, this project is generally abbreviated by the acronym ESMIA. Mali showed the importance of the concept of the sacred landscape in the layout and design of Egyptian monuments such as the pyramids and uh, some major temples. Esmea investigated whether Egyptian temples tended to be oriented toward the Nile, as was commonly believed, or to appropriate astronomical phenomena, as was commonly not believed. Esmea surveyed a remarkable 98% of the surviving shrines and temples in Egypt from all periods, from the Old Kingdom to the Roman period, located at nearly 400 sites around the country. The mission found that temples near the Nile were oriented to it, but in such a way that astronomical orientations were also very common. Both determinants of temple orientation could operate in tandem because it was possible to choose a site near the Nile, which after all does not run perfectly straight, such that the sighting would point the temple to the correct orientation to the sky, appropriate to the cult. Applying these findings to the Antinouéon, we might equate the double road off of which the sanctuary is located and toward which it's clearly oriented to the Nile. And um, I don't mean by that that the road symbolizes the Nile or anything like that, but it's a functional equivalent. It provides the, the, uh, the, the geospatial orientation point for the sanctuary, as the Nile does for Egyptian temples. It was an obvious determinant of the orientation of the complex, and though we have to Hasten to add, nothing required that Hadrian put the Antinouéon, or whatever this was, here. Look at the, all the green space, you, and this is only, the green space you see on the plan is only a fraction of the overall villa, which covered about 200 acres. It's mainly unbuilt. Hadrian could have put this feature anywhere. He didn't have to put it along this road. So it is oriented to the road, but there is nothing dictating uh, that choice of location. We should also stress that within the perimeter walls, the high perimeter walls that after all block the view toward the road and everything else, the built features could be positioned and oriented with complete freedom. Nothing dictated the arrangement of the three temples that we find there. They could have been next to each other or, and they could have been rotated 90 degrees. Uh, any, anything is possible and the whole size of the sanctuary might have, might have been different and there might not have even been three temples. Maybe you would have had one temple with three cellars. Anything was possible. Nothing is dictated in advance. So we can therefore look for intention behind the choices that we find and not just dismiss this and say, well, of course it was dictated by blah, blah, blah. So it makes sense to consider whether we find the same complementary terrestrial and astronomical factors dictating the orientation of the temples in the Antinouéan, as Esmea discovered in its Egyptian study. There were three temples within the complex, each with its own orientation. The possible astronomical orientation of each of these needs to be considered separately. We will have time today only to look at one temple, Temple C. The overall orientation of the sanctuary from the point of view of the ancient visitor entering from the access road runs from the east portal to Temple C. This was clearly the important axis for the ancient visitor to the site, and that is why I will use it as a representative sample to give you a taste of the methodology we employ and the conclusions we reached in our full study. We determined that from the vantage point of someone standing on this axis of entry, the sun, and, and looking away from the sanctuary through the portal, the sun rises in the period um, uh, on axis on the summer solstice in the 130s CE. You can see screen capture of such a sunrise simulated uh, in Stellarium. So here we have just doing screen capture of a real-time session with Stellarium. Now we're moving the cursor around the portal of entry. Now we see Temple A. We rotate the camera around Temple C down there at the end of the axis of entry and Temple B across the plaza from Temple uh, a. Now we'll go back to the uh, portal of, of entry. You'll note that we're on the summer solstice in the year 135, so June 24th. We will set the clock back to just before sunrise. We'll advance it minute by minute. And if you look in that slot of the doorway, the narrow portal, you will see the sun gradually start to rise 
three kilometers away over the slopes of the Monte Rispoli. And so we get what we call positional sunrise. And on that day, in terms of the flat horizon, sunrise was a bit earlier. But because we have the mountain out there, we call this positional sunrise. From the point of view of somebody here, uh, the sunrise is at uh, 5.15 uh, in the morning. And note that we are using uh, universal time, that's to say Greenwich time. So for Italy, we have to add an hour. Once we've discovered this new fact about the sanctuary that is oriented to sunrise on the summer solstice, we need to interpret it. First, we note that there was a major Roman holiday on the summer solstice, the festival of Fors Fortuna. Fortuna, fortune, uh, good luck. Next, we need to ask why this festival could be relevant to an Egyptianizing sanctuary. The answer is not far to seek. We know that the Romans assimilated this goddess precisely to Isis. Finally, Hadrian showed awareness of this association elsewhere at the villa. In earlier research that we published several years ago, we showed that the summer solstice was also important at Hadrian's villa, not only here at the, in the Antinouean at sunrise, but also at the lower rotunda of the tower-like feature given the modern name of, oops, Rocca Bruna, which you've been seen in this slide. We'll go back to it. There's Rocca Bruna today, and there's our reconstruction of the Rocca Bruna. It has an upper temple and a lower uh, sanctuary, which is, as you will see, a rotunda. And the uh, summer solstice is very important at sunset on the summer solstice, in, as seen in the uh, lower rotunda. Because as you can see in this uh, video clip showing our reconstruction at precisely the moment of sunset on the summer solstice in the 130s AD, we know that the sun illuminated, came through the main door and illuminated the statue opposite the door in the main apse. We have grounds to believe that the cult statue placed here was one of the many representations of Isis found at Hadrian's villa and that still survived. This one is a, is a model based upon an Isis in the Capitoline Museum from Hadrian's villa. Finally, we know that the summer solstice was also important in Egypt. As Mali notes, quote, rebirth was associated by several cultures with a winter solstice. This is not, however, the case with Egypt. Indeed, in the arid climate of Egypt, the natural phenomenon that allowed the rebirth of the crops was the inundation of the Nile, which started to rise precisely at the summer solstice each year. Therefore, it is rather the summer solstice which was identified as the harbinger of renewal in, for the Egyptians. So now, on the festival day of Isis Fortuna at Hadrian's Villa, we have a solar alignment at sunrise in the Antinouean and at sunset in the lower rotunda at Rocca Bruna. What about the other end of the axis of entry? That is where Temple C was located. We know that when Antinous died, the grief-stricken emperor carved out a new constellation in his memory. It, it was given the name Antinous, and it, it, it formed the stars in the lower part of the old constellation Aquila, the eagle, which you see here uh, in a screen grab of, of, of the representation of it uh, in Stellarium. And the arrow shows you the lower part, the, the lower wing going down. That's uh, Antinous, and we know exactly what stars were Antinous from the Hadrianic uh, astronomer, the famous Claudius Ptolemaeus, Ptolemy, who tells us what stars were in Antinous. And Antinous no, ceased to be a constellation in the 17th century, which is why some of you, uh, may be news to some of you that Antinous was ever a constellation. It, it isn't anymore a constellation. When we stood along the axis of entry and looked in the direction of Temple C, all through the year 135, we found one very interesting thing as we saw, as we learned when we did just empirical research, just making observations with no particular expectations. And you can see what this surprising thing is when we look at the screen capture of Stellarium for the date of November 27th of 135 AD. So there we are looking at Temple C. Now we're going just to orient you looking at Temple A again. Now we have the portal of entry. And now we're going to look at Temple B briefly, and then we'll go back to our Temple C. 
And once we're back to Temple C, we'll turn on this neat feature in Stellarium, which you, you can turn on the stars, you can turn on the constellations. We'll do that right now so we can see the constellations. And now we'll advance the hours of the day past sunset because, of course, you can't see the constellations until the sun goes down. And one thing we'll note is that the sun is actually setting right behind that statue. We've made a window. We don't really think there was a window behind the cold statue of Temple C, but we cut a window just so we could see the sun, and it sets on this date, November 27th, right behind the cold statue. And then as soon as it sets and it gets dark and the stars come out, the eagle, and especially the lower part of eagle, Antinous sets right behind the temple. So if the, the observer standing on that axis looking at the temple would see Antinous setting and going just as it comes into view, it would then set and leave view. That's always very dramatic and very memorable and something that archaeoastronomers look for. What is November 27th? It, this happens every day of the year, but it happens often in the daylight hours when you can't see it happening. Here we're seeing it happening, and we're seeing it happening at the setting which is always very significant astronomically. And what is November 27th? Anyone know? Antinous's birthday. So it's also his rebirth day. He's been taken up to heaven as a kind of Ganymede figure by the eagle, kind of Zeus figure, to become the new god. When Mary saw this, he was quite flabbergasted because all along, right from the beginning, he had identified Temple C as the likely temple of Osir Antinous, Antinous in the guise of Osiris. We have a lot of sculptural remains of this assimilation of, Os of uh, Antinous to Osiris, notably these two uh, telemones in the uh, Sala Greca of the Vatican Museum that you see on the left, which Mari restored in the front porch of Temple C. This is back in 2007 and even earlier. Uh, in this uh, axonometric reconstruction that he published uh, many times. He put into the cella of Temple C, or, or he hypothesized that one of the many statues of uh, Antinous in the guise of Osiris, all now in the Vatican Museum, stood in the cella of this temple. So he made this the temple of, Os of, of Antinous in the guise of Os Osiris. So needless to say, when Mari saw this thing happening on Antinous's birthday, he was really flabbergasted that his identification of Temple C was, I would say, confirmed in this new, uh, unexpected way by archaeoastronomy. Well, there's much more that could be said about the celestial alignments of the Antinoe, and each of those other two temples has significant uh, astronomical alignments, it turns out, that also support Mari's theory that this was the Antinoe and not anything else at the villa. Um, I have an article in press about it, and uh, you can read it when it comes out, which I hope will uh, be in a month or two. So um, in the interest of time, let's leave the countryside and go back to the capital at Rome. And the next project I'd like to discuss involves one of the first obelisks brought to Rome, the Montecitorio obelisk brought by Augustus from Heliopolis in Egypt. And it's one of the best preserved uh, Augustan monuments in Rome, as is the other monument we want to discuss, the Arapacus, that you see on the right in this slide. Let's start by noting that both monuments were restored and re-erected and moved in modern times. So they're not in their ancient locations. The so-called Montecitorio obelisk was brought by Augustus to Rome in 10 BC, or thereabouts, and set up in the Campus Martius, about 90 meters west of the Arapacus, which had been under construction in the same period, so since 13 BC, and was inaugurated in January of 9 BC. Explicitly dedicated by Augustus to the sun god, please read the English translation, especially the last line. This obelisk was used to support a sphere that served as the gnomon, or the pointer, of a monumental timekeeping device something we know from a famous chapter in Book 36 of Pliny's Natural History. Since the 16th century, scholars have debated the nature of the timepiece, alternating between a meridian, that is a line, single line that tells you noon every day of the year, and a huge horizontal sundial. In an influential article published in 1976, Edmund Buchner made the case in favor of the sundial theory. 
And here you can see his reconstruction of a big plaza with uh, the lines of a sundial engraved on it. The obelisk and the hour pockets you can see also. Buchner worked out a detailed reconstruction of his design and dimensions as part of a more general theory to explain the spatial and ideological relationship between the obelisk and the arapakas. Buchner's theory had three parts. The setup of the monuments, that is exactly where they were sited in the ancient city. This is not as obvious as you might think since although we do not know exactly where the arapakas, since we do know exactly where the arapakas stood because we have excavations of Moretti in the 1930s, beautifully published in 1948 uh, that shows exactly where the Arapacas foundations are in the map of the modern city under the modern Palazzo Fiano al Maggia. We don't know exactly where the obelisk was. We know the address, Piazza del Parlamento number three, but we don't know where at that address, and the building has a footprint of about 20 by 30 meters, so it could have moved around in that fairly big footprint. And every centimeter counts, as you will see. So that was a bit difficult. Moreover, Buchner speculated that there was a vast pavement, 70 by 160 meters, on which was inscribed a horizontal sundial. He thought that the sphere that we know from Pliny stood atop the obelisk and served as the gnomon for the sundial. As I've already indicated, other scholars uh, as early as the 18th century thought that there was no such pavement and no horizontal sundial, but just a single meridian line, a line going due north from the obelisk giving you the noon hour every day of the year. The purpose of the meridian is to tell you the noon hour each day of the year, and this matter of whether it was a, a sundial or just a meridian is still under debate, and recently the opinion has shifted back to the 18th century idea that the timepiece was simply a meridian. The second element concerns the environmental effect caused by the setup. Buchner thought that the effect concerned the shadow cast by the obelisk on Augustus's birthday, which was September 23rd. In particular, he speculated the shadow went down the equinoctial line. And actually, in this um, illustration, Buchner put the shadow on the equinoctial line. So the equinoctial line is an east-west line. Uh, the hour lines are running more or less uh, north-south. The equinoctial line is running uh, perpendicular to them. And you can see that the, the, the sphere, shadow of the sphere is touching that horizontal line, the equinoctial line. So Buchner thought that the, sh the, sh the shadow of the sphere went down the equinoctial line all day on Augustus's birthday and went right into the middle of the Arapacus. So his theory, uh, you can illustrate this way by adding the arrows to his diagram. At this point, it will be useful to look at an illustration of the effect that Buchner had in mind, because he never gives us an illustration of the effect he had in mind. In this slide, uh, you can see the obelisk shadow cast into the middle of the altar. And note, by the way, that the date is February 25th of 9 BC, and not Augustus's birthday, September 23rd. So I don't mean to imply that Buchner's theory is correct. As you will see, it's not correct. Finally, the third element was the message implicitly transmitted by the effect. Buchner thought it was that Augustus was born to bring peace, natus ad pacem, as he put it, in an inelegant Latin phrase not attested in the ancient sources. The purpose of our study was to test the validity of Buchner's theory about the relationship between the obelisk and the arapacus. Please note that this matter is separate from the controversy about the nature of the timepiece for which the obelisk served to support the gnomon, or the pointer. That is not an issue that we need to consider today. If anyone is interested, please ask uh, me about it in the question period. I've been lucky enough to, be, to have been granted access to Buchner's uh, archives and his geological cores in Munich and in Rome and to have digitized them. And, and I've, I've got all that information and I've studied it. And my conclusion is that Buchner's theory of the sundial and the related monumental pavement uh, is wrong and is not supported by the evidence that he himself brought to light. I agree with those who think that the timepiece was probably just a meridian, and we have construct, reconstructed it and think that it looks something like this. But we need not concern ourselves about this matter today. In studying Buchner's theory, we started by commissioning two independent surveys of all the monuments in question, and these determined that Buchner had made a major error in citing the obelisk onto the ground. 
As you see in this slide, he put it four meters too far to the east and two meters too far north. So uh, the solid line uh, at B uh, is our where we would put the meridian. And we put it there because of C, the fragment of the meridian that Buchner found. So that is the meridian. So there was really little debate about where it should go. Buchner had put it before he found the meridian. He had put the meridian at D, four meters to the east. And he never revised his plan, but kept publishing the plan that he had published several years before he did the field work that turned up the meridian, thereby, I would say, misleading, maybe not intentionally, but certainly misleading a lot of people. Some of them in this room, I think it's fair to say, and myself, one of them. Um, I'd like to just stop here to say that a lot of what I'm talking about, almost everything I'm talking about today involves the use of the computer. The use of the computer does not obviate the need to do field work and to go back and check the facts on the ground. In fact, it makes it more important because the computer can make things even more precise and we better be damn sure of our facts on the ground before we start crunching them in the computer because of the junk in, junk out principle, which is certainly valid in archaeology as in any other discipline. Once Buchner's error was corrected, we made a computer simulation of the area and used Stellarium for the year 9 BC to see whether the obelisk shadow really did go down the equinoctial line into the middle of the altar on Augustus's birthday. And here we have another screen capture of a real-time session with Stellarium. You see the shadow of the obelisk over there. On the left, you see the date is Augustus's birthday, September 23rd in minus 8 in Stellarium terms, it means 9 BC in our terms, because they don't have, they don't have, uh, uh, they have zero, <laughs> and there is no year zero. There's the uh, obelisk and the meridian. And there's the sun, needless to say. That little blob out there on the horizon is the Pantheon, by the way, the Augustan Pantheon. OK, so now let's advance the shadow. You can see where the shadow is. Uh, the cursor is circling it. Let's advance the shadow on a minute by minute basis. Boom, we're now on that equinoctial line at the foot of the stairs. OK, that's the key moment. Does it go into the altar? It starts going up the stairs, but veers off to the right, actually to an interesting place that John Pellini wrote about in a, this uh, group article that we're putting out about this. So what we can say about Buchner's theory is, though, it's wrong. Once you correct this sighting of the monuments on the ground, put the whole thing in the stellarium, simulate the event, it's close but no cigar. The shadow gets close to the front door, almost goes inside, but doesn't go inside. Meanwhile, you saw that it did go inside on February 25th on another day. So if that's important, the birthday of Augustus must, must not be the important day, at least if you follow Buchner's reasoning. We did, however, find that not only on February 25th, but also on 47 other days of the year, the effect that Buchner imagined happened on Augustus's birthday actually did occur. So Buchner may have been on the right track but he was simply wrong in detail. And here I'll just take, uh, t uh, give you an aside to say another point about this, which is that if you look at the whole prehistory of this problem before our work, everybody from Buchner and his, some of his critics, uh, uh, were like Schmidt, the uh, physicist in Tübingen, always were just offering one alignment, one date of alignment. The, and they were doing the calculations by hand or you know, maybe using a computer, but by hand, they, it was very difficult for them to generate one alignment, one solution for where was the sun in reference to the obelisk and its shadow then toward the uh, Arapacus. And uh, they could have done more, I suppose, but they sort of maybe got tired or they, oh, it sort of works, uh, we'll go with that. Now that we have it in Stellarium, we can do this in real time. We can turn the clock and the dials and move the minute hand and the hour hand and the day hand and the month hand and the year hand. And in a very short time, we're doing big data. We're making millions of calculations instantaneously, we're not making them, the computer is making them, which is a black box to us poor archaeologists, if, even if, assuming we could do the math, we don't have to. And we could do this all very quickly. We could change our position on the ground, move around, and stand in different vantage points and see what you could see, which the people before us were, were never able to do. They just stood in one place and made one calculation, crossed their fingers, hoped they were right, published and claimed they were, even if they weren't quite right. Um, so that's another point I would make, is that we, now we're able to actually move archaeology into the, to take advantage of, of all the, um, the research being done on big data. So 
So Buchner may have been right in, in, in general, but, but wrong in detail. We next studied the movements of the sun's disk along the axial line linking the center of the Arapacus and the obelisk. And we extended that line several hundred meters west of the obelisk and east of the Arapacus. So now what we're going to be studying is not the shadow of the obelisk, but the sun's disk centered atop the obelisk, as seen by somebody who can also see the Arapacus, or perhaps has the Arapacus at his back and can see the obelisk and is aware of the fact that he's positionally between the Arapacus and the obelisk, and sees this amazing coincidence of the sun's disk on top of the obelisk, which, by the way, in the Old Kingdom was the determinative in, um, in, in Egyptian uh, writing for a solar temple. And the obelisk, the Egyptians and the Romans knew this, was the symbol of a sunbeam. And all the obelisks come the, from, therefore from Sun City, Heliopolis, in Egypt, with the greatest sanctuary of the sun. So everything has to do with the sun. And this obelisk, as you saw, was dedicated by Augustus to the sun god. So he knew all this quite well. So now we're going to look at the sun. But you might say, was Augustus trying to blind everybody in the city of Rome by having them look at the sun? <laughs> Not bloody likely. But then you say, when did we actually know about solar retinitis and the fact that you shouldn't look at the sun? And you get into medical research on solar retinitis, and you find that the first article identifying it was published in the 1880s in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. And the first sentence was, it is very strange that in the entire preserved medical literature, there is not one instance recorded of blindness caused by looking at the sun. So until the 1880s, people didn't know that you shouldn't look at the sun. And mothers weren't telling their children, don't look at the sun. And of course, we know that Chinese astronomers in centuries BC reported sunspots. How did they see that? They didn't have telescopes. They didn't have filters. They looked at it with their eyes. The Romans used to, for 200 years, until the first Punic War determined uh, noon every day by having a, 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 a state uh, employee stand in front of the Senate House uh, site, use the Columna Mainiana as a site, and look where the sun, look at where the sun was on top of that. So the Romans looked at the sun. People all over the world, there's a book that came out in 2009 on naked eye, history of naked eye observation of the sun all over the world. So this is, uh, this is a, certainly something to worry about, but, but not, a, not a decisive objection. So let's then see what happens if we look. Does this ever happen? Do we ever see the sun's disk centered atop the obelisk? And could that be relevant to our question of the relationship of the Arapacus and this obelisk? So let's start with some background. As far as we know from the ancient sources, this entire area was, was nothing. It was wasteland. It was machia, this swampy area not used by the state uh, in any uh, consistent way before the Augustan age. And it was only in the time of Augustus that two continuous public parks were put into this area, separated by the Via Flaminia, which Augustus also restored, by the way, a few years earlier. So one of the parks was in the Campus Martius, this was put in by Augustus, and the other in the Campus Agrippi, which as the name implies was put in by Augustus's partner and eventual son-in-law, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Using Stellarium with reconstruction models of the Meridian, Obelisk, and Arapacus, we studied the years just after the completion of these monuments and discovered that in almost 240 days of the year, there were alignments between the Sun, Arapacus, and the Multicitoria Obelisk that could be seen somewhere along uh, this axial line uh, uh, in the age of Augustus and beyond. We put together a team of 12 co-authors, and John Pellini, happy to say, is one of them, to interpret these findings. Specifically, we found that for analytical purposes, you can divide the area into four zones. Zone one. runs from several hundred meters west of the obelisk to the base of the obelisk. It is one of the two zones where we have what we call intervisibility. That is where you can see both the obelisk and the Arapacus beyond. We started our investigation about 300 meters west of the obelisk, but as far as we can tell from the archaeological record nicely assembled for us by Lothar Hasselberger in, for the Augustan age, there were no buildings at all, all the way to the Tiber River, 1.2 kilometers to the west, and the, given the height of the Arapacus and the obelisk, you could have easily seen them uh, at that distance and, and, and well beyond. 
Like the other three zones of interest zone, one was essentially flat, and so the topography made a clear view easily available all along this part of the axial line. In zone one, we found 95 individual alignments in all. That is where the sun could be seen right on top of the obelisk, as you see in this uh, slide. The dates uh, in the area studied range from May 8th to August 10th and occur in the early morning, not long after sunrise. Obviously, we're looking toward the east, so we're talking about sunrise. Zone 2 runs from the west entrance of the Arapacus, which we're, we're seeing now in this capture from Stellarium. That's the entrance to the Arapacus, which we're standing in. Now we're going to swing around and take a look at the obelisk. So now we're looking to the west. So zone two runs from the west entrance of the Arapacus to a point about 23 meters from the obelisk where the summer solstice is reached. In addition to the summer solstice, there are two groups of dates running from March 19th to June 23rd and from June 25th to September 27th. The solar alignments occur in the mid to late afternoon. The first two pairs of alignments occur inside the western part of the Arapacus and thus entail intervisibility. You can see the Arapacus and the obelisk. The rest in, uh, involve what we call interpositionality. You've got the Arapacus to your back and the obelisk is in front of you, but you're pretty aware of the fact that you're, you've got the Arapacus to your back. You're aware of the fact that you're relating spatially to these two monuments. Altogether in this zone, we have solar alignments on 189 days of the year. Zone three, starts at the obelisk and ends at the west entrance to the Arapacus. So you put your back to the obelisk and you look toward the Arapacus. That's zone three. So it entails intervisibility because you never see the obelisk and the Arapacus together. You just see the Arapacus, but you're pretty aware of the fact that the obelisk is behind you. In the video on the screen, you see an example of this. For the other uh, uh, pairs, the, only the obelisk is visible in front of the observer while the Arapacus is to his back. So these alignments exemplify what we call interpositionality. Altogether in this zone, we have solar alignments on 189 days of the year. Finally, zone four is, like zone one, characterized by intervisibility. It runs from several hundred meters east of the Arapacus to about 14 meters east of the east entrance of the Arapacus. When you get that close to the Arapacus, you no longer can see, or any closer than that, you can't see the obelisk because the facade of the Arapacus blocks your view of the top of the obelisk. So if you go any closer, you're not going to see the obelisk. In the area studied, uh, we found uh, alignments in the mid to late afternoon from the period February 28th to March 13th and from October 13th to October 17th. And here is a more photorealistic uh, rendering of how one such alignment in zone four might have looked on October 9th of uh, 9 BC. And I, and I hope this conveys to you the sense of, of awesome, of awesomeness, of a religious awe that such an effect I think would, would have had on the ancient observer. And the fact that the emperor and his staff could, could make this happen is, I think, also significant, that they had the knowledge to, uh, to make these alignments recur. The Egyptians didn't have that knowledge because they didn't have the Julian calendar. And if you don't have the Julian calendar, the sun and the dates are out of sync. And, uh, and this cannot happen on a reliable annual basis. To summarize our findings in all four zones, the dates when solar alignments were found ranged from February 28th to October 17th. There were solar alignments a minimum of 224 days uh, of the year along, uh, along the line connecting the middle of the Arapacus uh, and the Monticitorio Obelisk. If we add the 48 dates of shadow alignment, we get some 239 days of the year in the period from February 25th to October 21st when there was at least one solar and, and or one uh, shadow alignment. Uh, uh, each year, and on some days you have both a shadow and a solar alignment. In fact, the most interesting such example, and the only example where you got the solar and shadow alignment when you stood at the same spot, was detected by our co-author, 
John Pellini, to whom we're very grateful for this. And he detected that special spot, which is the base of the west staircase up to the Arapacus, so a very marked spot, on Augustus's birthday, oh. September 23rd. <laughs> That, of course, was the birthday and the date that Buchner had thought was so important and the key to everything. And the spot is not just anywhere, but it's marked. Uh, there's a built feature there, and it's an obvious feature, the base, uh, the, the bottom of the stairs up into the Arapacus. And as I've already said, this is the only single point where you get the shadow and the solar alignment at the same place on the same day. Because otherwise you can get the two things happening, but you have to stand in different places to see it. Yet our overall conclusion was not that Buchner was right after all, uh, and, and that Augustus's motivation was simply to honor himself. The awesome events that we found on the other 238 uh, days of the year were also intentional as is evidenced by the fact that when we ran experiments moving the obelisk closer to and farther from the altar, we found that its actual location, about 90 meters west of the altar, was in a Goldilocks position. Had the obelisk been positioned farther away than 90 meters, say 140 meters, moving 50 meters to the west, you would have got more alignments every year, but you would have had, uh, you would have had uh, attenuated or reduced vi visibility of the obelisk as seen from the Arapacus or seen to the east of the Arapacus. If you had moved the obelisk closer to the Arapacus, you would have had increased visibility and visual connection between the two monuments, but you would have had fewer alignments. The 90 meter position is the Goldilocks position. It's the just right position where you can maximize the visibility of the two monuments, the visual connection of the two things, and the number of alignments that result from them. That Augustus should have pursued a both and approach, both honoring the sun god and himself, is not surprising. If we think again of the inscription on the base, dedicating the obelisk to the sun god, and take our departure from Augustus's stated intention of bringing the obelisk to Rome as a gift to that god, then self-celebration by the donor would have been too narrow a goal. We may say that Augustus made his birthday the moment in time celebrated forever after on the Roman religious calendar that he himself had definitively reformed because the, Julius, the Julian reform of, under Julius Caesar was incorrectly uh, applied and had to be fixed in the, precisely in this period that we're talking about of when Augustus becomes Pontifex Maximus in 13 or 12 BC. So we can say that Augustus made his birthday and the moment in time celebrated forever after on the Roman religious calendar, the moment in which the sun god intersects with and is incarnated in humanity. In this connection, it is relevant to recall that in Augustan propaganda, Augustus was, was presented as the son of Apollo, a god with strong solar associations in Greece and Rome. And sometimes, as in the case of this gem in Florence, Augustus was even assimilated to his tutelary divinity, Apollo. The concept of Augustus' special relationship with Apollo had a strong Egyptian resonance. Since the pharaoh was always the sa re, or the son of the sun god re. Here we should recall that Augustus was not only the first Roman emperor, but also the first Roman to be the pharaoh of Egypt. To conclude, I will repeat that it is now fairly easy and certainly potentially rewarding to add an astro astronomically correct dynamic celestial model to the skies above our terrestrial models of cultural heritage sites. Doing so will help us settle scholarly debates such as the validity of the theory we have been examining of Edmund Buchner uh, or that of Zachary Amari about the Antinouéan at Hadrian's Villa. And I'm even more confident that be beyond their archaeo-astronomical applications, an approach like this will do two important things in terms of the development of the humanities. For the first time, it will make historical studies empirical, or what I like to call sympirical. That's a portmanteau uh, manteau term that combines empiricism and computer simulations. 
We never could travel back in time to the past to make observations or to run experiments in historical disciplines. Now, thanks to computer simulations, we can. Secondly, I wish to stress that by exemplifying empiricism in today's lecture with a case study involving, two case studies actually, involving archaeoastronomy, I do not wish to suggest that empiricism is limited to this one rather restricted area of research. Rather, as we apply empirical methods, we are bound to make many more discoveries of unsuspected ways in which monuments, buildings, and settlements functioned and yielded meaning in relation, yes, to the heavens above, but also to human behavior on the ground as well. Just to cite the latest example, Giulia Viani Pulisi, one of the graduate students in our new doctoral program in virtual heritage, is challenging the commonplace view that the feature at number 14 on the uh, plan of the South Theater at Hadrian's Villa, the so-called Odeon, was the imperial box. And she's challenging that on the basis of her work with the, uh, a professor of acoustics in the Jacob School of Music at Indiana University, uh, who helped her to find and apply the software to do an acoustic analysis of the theater, which you see here on the left. And that shows that that was actually a dead spot <laughs> acoustically. If you, if you were there, you couldn't hear very well. So not a good place for anyone, let alone the emperor. Since the vitality of any discipline is largely a function of how productive it is in bringing to light what was previously unknown. Virtual archaeology is, I think it is safe to say, one way in which the new digital humanities can help to keep the old humanities alive and well in the 21st century. In doing so, we may be taking advantage of advanced technology, scientific knowledge, and the scientific methodology of empiricism, but I hope I have shown why this need not in any way compromise the central task of the humanities which is not to measure, weigh, and determine the physical composition of things, but to tell us why they should matter to us in purely human terms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that great lecture. Fascinating as it is with um, these many ramifications for archaeology and the new technology. Uh, what we're going to do next is uh, Selma Holo will talk very briefly about her new book, which just came out. Uh, we'll have like a 10 to 15 minute break. Uh, please come up and have some refreshment while the participants of the round table get set up here. And then we are following the, uh, the food and wine and other drinks. Uh, we will start the uh, round table, which will last about 25 minutes. Uh, and then open uh, to questions from the audience. Okay, so that's cool. how things are done. So, Selma, you're on. Check with the slide, right? Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Bernie, I think, without getting too political at all, we feel the burn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> finally, I, finally, my name is a good name. It's a good name. <laughs> an embarrassing name my whole life. <laughs> it's a wonderful name. And um, before I talk for really a very short time, about the, uh, about the book. I just want to give you an idea of how things happen in our world. I was in Oaxaca. Uh, we were having an IMI Encuentro or little conference. Uh, we were involved with Nellie, as always. Nellie Robles, the great, great archaeologist in, in, in Mexico. And she said to me as we were kind of winding up, sell me, sell me, sell me, don't come with me. And um, I, want, I want you to come to a little talk that we're having with Bernie Fisher, whom I did not know. And there's really something wonderful for you to see. And I saw, I was there, and I heard, and I was privileged to be um, a, 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 an observer of this, of the beginnings of this wonderful um, uh, lecture that you heard today. So after it was all over, I went up to him and I said, oh, "Do you know John Fellini?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, of course I know John Fellini." And then it was a small world. And then I went back to John and I said, "Well, you know Bernie, and and, and, and Bernie knows Nelly, and, and we have, yeah, I am I, and Vicon, who we bring everybody together." And that's how it happened. So thank you for coming with your crutches and everything uh, to be a part of this conversation because you're so integrally involved with it. And you're going to have the honor of having uh, Nellie as part of the round table after we have our, our, our little break. Uh, where's, where's my team? My team? My team? I'm back here. My team? Oh, you want to come up I'll as come co-author? I'll just wait for okay. back here. Turn around. <laughs> Take. 
Uh, just we, we have a few copies in here if any of you are interested. But what I want you to know is we're very excited about this book, which came again as a result of the Oaxaca Encuentros, which have, we've now had our second triennial, we'll have another one uh, in, in a couple more years. And in those Encuentros, what we have done is to try to mix up the conversations that are traditionally had in the museum world. And instead of having art museums only talking to art museums and history museums and history museums and university museums to university museums, we began to create conversations where there were, there were um, frames where we could, we, could, we could understand how we could learn from each other. And we, we kind of stole a theory from the natural sciences called panarchy. And uh, a man named Gunderson, who worked in the natural sciences, and invented this theory for the natural sciences, and we talked with him about it. It had never been applied to the cultural world before. And what we did, we, we took the, his adaptive life loop of origins and conservation and uncertainties and renewal. And we brought our various uh, writers, 40 writers together, under those, those, those frames. And we were able to have very, very vital conversations, which are in there, that reflect a kind of panarchy. Again, of, of, of the director of the Metropolitan Museum, for example, being in the same set, uh, chapter as the, uh, the director of the small Pueblo Museum in, in, in Oaxaca, in Mexico or science museums in conversation with and showing where they are in a stage of uncertainty with museums that are unlike them entirely, but share growth pains. It's kind of an organizational theory. Anyway, uh, my team and I gathered a couple of Nobel Prize winners, Nellie Robles, uh, some small, small little uh, museum directors into these conversations. We're very excited about it. It's already being used in strategic thinking for museums as museums approach these different life phases in their anarchic lives. Not anarchy, not hierarchy, but something else which comes out of the, um, the, the, the Greek idea of pain and, and, uh, and all conversations being together. So anyway, enjoy your um, UC, Press. UC Press. Yeah, a wonderful, wonderful uh, example of, of the press to work with whenever you can. Uh, you're going to have your refreshments. We're here to talk to you if you want to talk about the book. And um, and then afterwards, John will make the proper introductions right. of our of our roundtable and tell us what to do. Okay. So and the books over there. And and so we will help. archaeologist who for more than two decades has contributed greatly to the field of cultural resources management through her pioneering work that incorporates an array of dynamic new strategies while taking into account, of course, the needs of local communities. Recently, she held a Fulbright Fellowship for a year at Harvard, and before obtaining her PhD in anthropology in 1994, from the University of Georgia, where she was also a Fulbright scholar. Nellie had already earned degrees in archaeology and architectural restoration in Mexico. In 1985, she became director of the Mitla Archaeological Research and Restoration Project in her home state of Oaxaca. Twelve years later, she was appointed director of Oaxaca's archaeological zone of Montalban. Uh, a large pre-Columbian World Heritage Site, as you saw earlier. Nelly has also served as head of archaeology for all of Mexico, and presently she serves as the director of the Atzompa Archaeological Site. Nelly is the author or editor of nearly a dozen books on Oaxacan archaeology and heritage management, and, management, and she has also uh, spoken at more than 100 national and international conferences on these subjects. For her efforts in linking North American and Mexican archaeologists, she won in 2008 the Presidential Award of the Society for American Archaeology. Firmly committed to passing on her knowledge to the younger generation, 
I no longer qualify. <laughs> Nellie has been engaged in teaching at universities both in Mexico and the United States and in supervising doctoral dissertations. And next to uh, uh, Nellie on your right is Dr. Chris Johansson. Uh, Chris is an assistant professor of classics and digital humanities at UCLA. His research applies the tools and techniques of digital humanities and analyt analytical methodologies of classics to social historical problems. Chris is currently uh, completing a hybrid geotemporal publication titled Funerary Spectacle Aristocratic Display in the Roman Forum, which is under contract with the peer-reviewed open access publication project of California Classical Studies. His work on the Roman world connects to a larger discussion on the evolution of scholarly tools and communication. And he is keenly interested in developing new methods of historical visualization, knowledge representation, and visual argumentation. His projects have been awarded funding from the annual, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Amundsen Foundation, Google, and the MacArthur Foundation. As co-director of, of the UCLA Experimental Technology Center, director of Rome Lab and the Humanities Virtual World Consortium, and as a founding member of the UCLA Digital Humanities Program, Chris has collaborated on mapping and visualization projects set in Bolivia, Peru, Albania, Iceland, Spain, Turkey, and Italy. So quite a spread. And next to him is Dr. Justin Underhill, who is presently a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in USC's Digital Humanities Visual Studies Research Institute. Justin received his PhD in 2012 in the Department of Art History at Berkeley. His dissertation, World Art and the Illumination of Virtual Space, makes use of advanced software to reconstruct architectural contexts in which works of art were displayed in order to explore the relation between pictures and the lighting of the space in which they were originally viewed. Justin's research includes architectural and pictorial assemblages from not only Renaissance and Baroque Northern and Southern Europe, but also Mediterranean and North American contexts. He is presently in the process of completing a book manuscript uh, titled Light, Sound, and Deception. So, without fiction. What's that? Depiction. Oh, what did I say? Deception. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be in the bottom half the wall. That's deception. <laughs> the eyesight's going. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll begin. Uh, each person will have about five minutes or so to ask questions, comment on Bernie's uh, lecture. Uh, raise new issues or talk about anything in Gage Bernie uh, with, uh, with anything uh, you want to uh, say and also anybody can jump in. So uh, we start. Who would like to start? Okay. Well, Justin can raise his hand first. I want to thank you for such a wonderful talk. You covered a lot of ground and I think uh, answered a lot of questions. Um, I was wondering if you could start by talking about what I think is one of the most exciting new fields, which is the application of acoustic uh, models, um, namely Odeon software and a um, few other programs that uh, make this data available. But your lab seems to be one of the few people are doing it at Stanford as well. It's really engaging as an ancient cultural site. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Because you've made a little. I can only really talk a little bit about it because Julia Pulisi, who's this young, brilliant uh, doctoral student who came to us from Berkeley, where she was a classics major and an honor, honor student just this year, had this idea uh, really on her own. And uh, I didn't suggest that to her. She found it on her own through uh, her study in the Jacobs School of Music, which is one of the, I shouldn't say it here, you say at USC, which has a great musical school, but it's one of the great music schools in our, of our country. And they have uh, some. Uh, some professors of acoustics. So she was studying uh, with them and had the idea of combining her interest in acoustics with her uh, interest in archaeology and, and virtual reconstruction. 
and uh, so I really can't take credit for it, and I can't say that uh, it was part of my research agenda, except in the most general sense that empiricism really can be any sort of experiment or observation of any of the senses in any of these environments or the objects of the environments. So I certainly support it, but um, I, I'm, ha I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that, that there isn't much of it going on, because uh, I uh, have been telling Julia that this is very innovative, very innovative idea that she's had. She's using this software called, this French open source software called uh, iSimpla. I don't know if you've heard of that. One of the main kind of philosophical issues that's raised against what you're calling empiricism uh, is that our satisfactory benchmarks for something being acoustically clear or sufficiently bright to read come from modern industrialized standards. And what a Roman might not have wanted to read by or hear clearly would have been arguably very different. How do you get around that? Because it's something that people sometimes raise against my work when I say, oh, this would have been a you know, bad place to stand when you heard something. Say, oh, 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 oh. How do you get around those issues? It, it, it is uh, you know, hard to go from our standards to what the ancients would have done. And uh, with acoustics in particular, if you're doing a theater, then there's so many variables. For one thing, we start out with how do you reconstruct the theater in the first place? And this particular theater, has, unfortunately, has never been the study of a monographic study. It could be, if anybody had a lot of money because it still is on the part of Hadrian's Hill. It's in private hands, uh, owned by the Bulgarini family for many centuries, and they would love to see the uh, structure studied and, and restored. And the Scanai Fronts is still completely standing. It's been totally despoiled because as early as uh, time of Paul VI, we have a record mentioned some decades later by Piero Liguria that it was despoiled. Statues were found there. The muses that are now in the Prado in Stockholm came from the Scanai Fronts. And, and so on. So, uh, but nevertheless, the theater has never really been properly studied. So the first thing if you're going to do an acoustic study is you have to know whether you've got your space down right. On top of which, if you read your Frank Sear on Roman, the architecture of Roman theaters, that, which is a wonderful monographic study of all known theaters, at least that's the, the goal, but many, many theaters, is that there are all sorts of uh, perishable elements that were critical, critical for acoustics, precisely for acoustics, like the wood especially. Um, the wood the that was in the wood ceiling, the, the baffles, and they, and then you had the use of, of uh, amphorae for as amplification under the stage, and then you have the masks, and the fact that the masks had uh, sort of little mini megaphones in them. So we put all this, so much uncertainty, it's very hard to figure out, um, you know, really with acoustics what you should be looking at. And so with Julia, what I said was, well, why don't you, given all these variables, why don't you just have the goal uh, of trying to figure out what the best design ought to have been, figuring that the Romans would have, through, you know, willy nilly through uh, trial and error, maybe have it, uh, arrived at that, especially when it comes to the wooden, I think the most important elements for acoustics are the wooden things, especially the, uh, the ceiling over the stage, which reflected the sound out. Um, this, we went out and assume that they experimented uh, with that and uh, made it as good as possible, but, and tried to figure out what the angle would be in the size to get the optimal results. Rather than assuming the optimal results and then saying, well, could you, what could you hear out here in this seat or that seat? Um, because then you, it quickly becomes a vicious circle that you, you know, it's too, too much is unknown. So uh, probably these, that kind of acoustic uh, study of what could you hear, what was it like, would be better done where you had much more evidence and, and there was much less uncertainty in the space itself. And I think there are many historic theaters that, that would lend themselves to that. What, may I ask you, turn it around, what's the nature of the space you're working in? Does it still exist or did you have to totally reconstruct it? Yeah, I'm working on a cathedral, a cathedral that was, has various dates between medieval times and up to the 19th century when it was so you can be pretty I sure. You have a lot more data. Yeah, a lot more data. So, so you can ask that kind of question, given what we know. What is? What could you hear standing right. this far away from the altar or the right. choir or whatnot? Okay, Natalie, you had a question. Oh, well, how about some comments and some some many questions? <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I really want to thank 
my good friend Selma, Selvita. <laughs> always finds a way to take me to very important uh, gatherings like this one. Thank you, Bernie, for being here and uh, all the, the people who made this possible because we are partners in several ways. And, uh, and it is not always easy for me or for uh, uh, um, Mexican National Institute of Anthropology and History, which uh, where I, I work, um, to bring people together. It's, it's, it's always difficult. But um, one of the luckiest uh, things that happened to me and my project was to find Bernie after several years of knowing each other. Uh, well, three years ago, we, we coincided in a, in a meeting on new technologies in Mexico City. And that was it, because we started working. Uh, he came uh, to Oaxaca. And we started doing some uh, of the field work that you already saw in the screen on uh, the flying on drones and taking the images of, the, of this part of the Monte Alban Zapotec capital and um, paving the road for us to have a much better uh, spatial analysis and much better understanding of of the volumes we are working with in this huge uh, uh, site uh, where sometimes or many times we kind of get lost uh, by stone by stone instead of looking at the entire uh, forest, right? So that was that was very nice um, addition to our our project, but that's the the the, the starting point. Now we have to continue working on the analysis of what we have in terms of images because he, for example, didn't didn't show the tombs that that he was able to scan and let us see the, the enormous details that the tombs and all funerary uh, objects we, we we have already restored and have ready for uh, the museums, but. Uh, uh, having these uh, new technologies working with us, it is now possible to to deliver the, the objects and have the images to continue working through the years. So it's a, it's a very important addition. On the other hand, it is very important for us to have um, uh, colleagues like, like Bernie to help us with the, with the field work and then continue uh, on the distance, working together with the data and having uh, developed several ideas on the interpretation of the sites just by uh, clicking computer and <laughs> things like that. It's just amazing. So um, I think the new technologies have uh, opened an enormous field for archaeology and for museum studies. Uh, because it, it gives us opportunities to continue and, and to, to think about several other aspects of our own works. So I'm, I'm very lucky to, to be part of this. And I thank you, Bernie, and everybody who does this possible. Um, and the question I had for Bernie is, uh, is just one question. When are you coming back to Oaxaca? <laughs> <laughs> um. We want, well, we'd love to come back as soon as possible, and I put in a proposal for, a, for the plan that we were talking about to document other sites in the Oaxaca area, Mitla and so on, and there's so many uh, World Heritage Sites all, and uh, I was told by my university that it looked good to get funding, and they would have a meeting last Friday, and I said, well, I'm going to see Nellie on Tuesday, could you let me know? And I keep looking at my email, and they're not letting me know, but um, I'm optimistic we will get some funding to continue maybe uh, this uh, December. So uh, I'll keep you informed, but I can't say anything right now, unless there's a patron out here in the audience who's willing to step forward. Uh, but I think my university will come through. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, Chris? Yeah, well, I can now uh, piggyback on your project. Please. Thanks, Bernie, for the fantastic talk. Uh, I've been working with you off and on. Half of the countries listed in my introduction were visited in part due to Bernie, I'm, I'm certain. Um, and it looks like right now, at least, what you're presenting really is the fruition of 
what was, I think, rhetoric early on when talking about digital technologies, and now is actualized. You can do things for once. In the past, we talked about them, now we can. And one of my questions relates to this, looking towards the future. And that is something that you mentioned in your project in Oaxaca, that you created, in how many days? 55,000 photographs? Two days, 55,000 photographs. And lurking behind that, I think, is the important point that this photographic record is something that if you were to share with the world, or if any archaeologist would, this is the kind of data that can live on and be built on forever, regardless of whether you're going to create 3D models today. And I wanted to ask you first, one of a, a number of questions, whether you think that in modern archaeology there's an ethical requirement to document sites in this way, regardless of whether you're going to create 3D models immediately. That is, archaeologists who are not doing this, who are not walking away from a site thinking that they're documenting every trench with 10,000 photographs, are, 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 are now walking the ethical line of not doing full duty. Because it really is that easy. It didn't used to be so. Photographs 10 years ago you'd throw away digitally or trash. Now, not, not so much. Well, in another version of this talk, uh, to show the uh, example of documentation, that duty of documentation, that activity. I didn't use Atsampa, I used Koza, which is a site we're supporting with technology in Tuscany. It's a Roman site. And uh, there what I showed was uh, our, our model of a trench uh, and the different uh, stratigraphic units of the trench. So each stratigraphic unit is a 3D model. So before the stratigraphic unit was taken out, it was documented in 3D. Uh, with the drone flying around, and, uh, and then the model was made. What you get then is a kind of exploded view of the trench with each stratigraphic unit from the top on down, on top of one on top of the other, and you can in real time explore it and you have that record. Archaeology is destructive, a destructive <coughs> process. It really will, I'm sure will be within five or ten years when government uh, authorities realize what can be done, how easy it can be done, how inexpensively. There will be a duty to document in 3D these uh, trenches level by level before they're taken out and, and destroyed and, and lost forever. And that will have, I think, not just an important, it's not just an ethical uh, issue there, that's, which is fundamental and the initial uh, good point about that, but it will also do something different, which I guess in a different way is also involves an ethical issue, and that is you who have read and used archaeological reports, you are very reliant on the honesty, the accuracy, the acuity, the intelligence of the person writing the report. And you don't have any, most of the time you have nothing else. You have to rely on that report and hope and then build on it. Um, it's very hard to second guess the excavator because you can't go back and see the site has been destroyed. But with this 3D documentation, you can go back and second guess and have a new interpretation. We actually published an article a few years ago by a young scholar in Berlin who did that with a stratigraphic excavation, actually undertaken before 3D in the 1950s by Mortimer Wheeler. But because it was a stratigraphic uh, excavation, she was able to, with computer graphics, reconstruct the, the site and then develop a new interpretation. And I think that's also exciting. So there's also an analytical payoff that you can re-excavate the site once you have this kind of documentation. Uh, to pick up on that very issue of the destructive nature of archaeology, which everybody taking an archaeological class learns. But there's a very simple way, I think, in order to see or reverse the process. And that is with uh, cameras, surveillance-type cameras, you can just document from different angles the entire process of, the, of excavating and then replay, putting everything back. So you can zoom in. And, and, and what we did in the, in the uh, COSA thing, and I said, we, I really should give credit to Matthew Brennan, who's a doctoral student in, in my program, and it was his idea, and he's running that show. He's there all by himself. But one idea he had was uh, using the GoPro, which he had for the drone, we have many of them. He put a few of them around the trench and then use the time-lapse photography feature of them. And it, so, you know, not only can you do that, but you can do that in a very consistent way uh, every couple of minutes for the entire season. And you can do that with this trench in Koza. It's quite remarkable. 
Uh, so then that helps even the, the project director, who's not always present at, at, at the trench every, every minute uh, of the day, and uh, anyone who wants to study the history of it. It's a new form of, of documentation where you can be there and observe it happening. Okay, I have one general question uh, that has to do with the accuracy of these three-dimensional models, which I think is a real important thing. Uh, and also, how does one convey to individuals online who don't have the background in archaeology or the, whatever field uh, they're in uh, that's necessary for understanding these monuments, how do you convey to individuals of this sort uh, the limitations of our evidence. I think that's a very important thing because if we're trying to communicate beyond the halls of academia with the, and, and that is involve a larger audience, uh, it's important to make known to them that there are limitations. What they're looking at online is not how it actually looked, maybe, in antiquity. Uh, and that is a big problem. And what comes to mind is uh, several years ago, at the uh, national meetings of the uh, Archaeological Institute of America, Jim Packard gave a talk about the reconstructed model of, that he made for the theater of Pompey in Rome. And he showed not the usual three levels of the theater, but a fourth level. And then after the uh, talk, when it was open to questions, one of these scholars said, what is your evidence for the fourth level? And he says, there is no evidence. So this is one of the problems as I see, and especially in dealing with the general public. Are there, do you have any strategies or ways to well, yes. deal uh, with that problem? This, has been, this was a very big concern in the 1990s in uh, professional organizations like computer applications and archaeology, and then resulted in the middle 2000s in this, uh, this draft ECOMOS uh, charter called the London Charter. And then there's a, a supplemented by the Seville Charter more recently. So we have these two charters. And they are, are devised to uh, develop best practices for computer reconstructions of cultural heritage. And one of and, and this particular point of uncertainty and uh, hypothesis, which is inevitable in trying to uh, make any kind of, uh, propose any hypothesis of reconstruction of anything in any field, uh, not just archaeology, uh, the London Charter Group developed a, a, the new concept of paradata. So metadata is the kind of information about the data that a librarian would love, like the title of the book, and the author of the book, and the date it was published, and the place it was published, and the rights issues, who owns the copyright. So that's we call that metadata. Paradata is the data kept uh, sort of on the side while you're making the thing. <clears throat> it's uh, processual information about uh, uh, precisely about uh, the information you had available, the, the, the guess, the gaps in the information you had available that you would like to have had, how you filled those gaps, um, often by guesswork, but guess, pure guesswork, like in the case you just cited Jim Packer, or maybe by arguing from analogy. Analogy from what? Is there another theater in the fourth level that you could have invoked to justify that in some way? So. That's all recorded in the paradata. And in the London Charter, it is the duty, especially because of the use of this for, pub by the public for communication, to always publish the model with the paradata, the paradata with the model. So, and I have to say, uh, having done demos for the public, even little school kids, uh, at starting at UCLA in the mid 1990s in the visualization portal, uh, which is a kind of a Oculus Rift of la lettre. Uh, kind of place where we could bring people in to see these 3D models in stereo with binocular vision and move them around in real time in these spaces. It cost millions of dollars, now it's costing near $600 to do that. Um, even school kids would say, well, how do we know that very quickly? You know, uh, it's a very natural human question to be curious about what you're looking at, especially if it doesn't look that way today. So we do have that responsibility. Uh, I should mention that um, Nick Cipolla and I, for my book on, um, on Augustan art, uh, created uh, a three-dimensional model for the mausoleum of Augustus. And we also created a virtual reconstruction console, uh, and that console it had various icons, for example, like the statue of Augustus atop the mausoleum, the trees or other elements of that monument. When you clicked on the uh, icon, up would come the uh, literary, epigraphical, and the archaeological 
uh, information to each of these things. Plus, we had a, um, a meter of accuracy so that you could see to what degree this is true or not. So there are ways that one yeah. can And then you're doing paradata, yeah. and how, you know, the charter goes to uh, tell you how to implement it, it just says do it, and that was one yeah. way you were doing it. Yeah. Maybe you didn't know the term, yeah. or, but you were, that's what you were doing, yeah. and that was great. You John, can I tell you? Yes, I was going to say, one, next one question. One small point, so sure. related to that, and I think that there's a large cultural shift that's occurred from the 90s to the 2000s, and you know, now to the present day, in the interpretation of visual imagery. I mean, no longer does any student at UCLA accept an image as real when they see it. Everything is computer generated in faith, from Grey's Anatomy backdrops to almost any kind of big thriller. So I think the initial assumption almost always is what's real, as opposed to this is the real reconstruction accurately done. And now there's, an, there's, there's more of an inquisitive nature than ever before with yeah. the image. Well, that obviously comes with time and people or students becoming more familiar with the new technology and its limitations. The big problem always remains is with the general public when you put things on the web in particular. Yeah. Okay, uh, Selma, you wanted to? I just want to ask one question that's very important for this whole conversation, and that is, and maybe I could direct it to Nellie, but John, you've also worked with me on museums. What are the implications for you mentioned museum studies, museology, the public, the presentation to the public of all of this. Is there a link, is there any richness in it that museum people should be thinking about as well? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, these uh, 3D technologies and general new technologies allows us a lot more uh, interpretive issues. Uh, as I said before, we now can can see our side from different perspectives, uh, just like that. Just <laughs> but um, also the objects, the objects sometimes to our eyes they hide details. So uh, new technologies help us to 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 see details that we don't usually see. Like for example, the, the array of colors. We have um, a special uh, funerary urn in, that you know in Atzompa. But we, we, we weren't able to, to, to see uh, the, the, the many different tones and colors that it has until we saw it depicted in a screen, on a screen with a lot of detail. Uh, I was telling you earlier about the, the nature of this uh, rock art that we just found in Oaxaca, an incredible um, cave painted in all the walls uh, with different kinds of paintings. They are mostly hands with different tones, different colors, different clays, different uh, techniques. Uh, but they have layers under. So new technologies like this will help us to, to have the different layers and interpret much better the history of the paintings and the, uh, the timing and, and the, the, the history to, to be the way it is today. So it opens a lot of, a lot of information for us and that I think that's the, the best of it. And I can also add that several years ago when I was working on a project on recarving uh, Roman portraits from one emperor into another um, and projecting one image inside of another image in a three-dimensional way, we could see how images were recut. Um, and uh, one of the things that I started to think about that, because we did this at the Getty Villa, was scanning images, which are, that is uh, portraits or sculptures in museums that one can, with a hand scanner, um, make the scan so you have a 3D model of the actual uh, work in order to do this kind of analysis and recutting. But then it dawned upon me that this is something that museums should be doing, is producing this, because it's very simple, uh, it's non-destructive, uh, and that way it's the next best thing to the actual object. Uh, if there's an earthquake, if there's destruction, or if you have ISIL in your backyard, uh, if you have at least a 3D model, 
Uh, not only is this valuable to turning at any angle for scholars to make comparisons, but also as a document to have for museums. So in case anything happens to an original work uh, of art, uh, you will have at least a 3D model, which is the best, better, much better, obviously, than photographs. And this, in fact, is what Bert, Bernie is now going to be undertaking at the, uh, the Uffizi. And I published an article on, on this and brought up this subject of, of the need for this sort of thing in museum. And, and, and did I understand your question to be aimed also at the use of 3D technologies for, um, for interpretation and for, therefore, for the uh, organization of exhibitions and for communication of art and architecture eventually to the, to the public. So, um, I mean, my colleagues so far have talked, I think, more from the point of view of the curator and the conservator of doing research on, on art. But thinking about it for the public, we are, have uh, developed the Uffizi project in such a way that the, Indi the uh, Indi Indiana U University Museum of Art uh, is a partner. And they are going to have a series of exhibitions with the Uffizi. Uh, one of which, probably the first one of which, will uh, allow us, using 3D, to bring a famous gallery, the Tribuna at the Uffizi, to Bloomington and put it into the temporary exhibition hall using the Oculus Rift. So it's very easy to, um, using a 360 video, to um, make a three-dimensional representation of a space like the Tribuna, which is filled with important works of art, like the Medici Venus, for example and to uh, make digitize that and make that available anywhere in the world. Why would you do that? Because in the show, what is going to be uh, seen in the gallery are paintings of the Tribuna uh, through time, especially it's often these painting from the 18th century, which is in the Queen's Collection at Windsor and never travels, but we think we can uh, get it. And we'll also probably bring one work of art, at least from the Tribuna itself. But this is a way in which 3D can be used to recontextualize art and to make that context very portable so it could be anywhere in the world. And you can move it from Florence to Bloomington at very little expense and in a very realistic way and give the visitor the sense of what often he uh, was seeing when he was painting. And also, on the other hand, probably the differences between the Tribune in the time of Zofany and the way it is today. Any other questions? I can add one last follow-up too. It does seem like this is also the the right time for MLIS programs to to work together with digital humanities programs initiatives and start to build up that kind of knowledge base and training because that's really the way to 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 to, to infiltrate museums for the future, right? Is through this kind of symbiotic relationship. Okay, great. So now we'll turn to the audience for any questions, comments of either Bernie or complaints. <laughs> that too. Over there. Um, I really enjoyed all of this, uh, especially the presentation, and I think one of the things that was so exciting, I'm sure, for everyone in the room is getting to see the actual videos of um, what you've been doing with this 3D technology, uh, because it's one thing to just sort of know and have read about, you know, that art and architecture oftentimes is made for a specific environment, and should be interpreted based on how that environment changes. And it's quite another thing to actually see it happening, like seeing the sun aligning with an obelisk, especially when that's not necessarily a view that you can get anymore. And also, you mentioned you know, all of these research papers that are being written now that are kind of using this technology. And I'm sort of wondering if you have a sense of where you're going to head. And I guess this kind of adds on with the conversation that just happened about like, you know, a student who's reading a research paper that the author has used this technology, um, you know, and they're just a student in an undergraduate classroom, whether they can access these videos and actually see it happening. Like, do you have a sense of that occurring, like people getting that access at all? Yes, that's a very good question that you uh, like to talk, and that you want to get your pause on the technology. And so that's why we started this journal called Digital Applications in Archaeology and Cultural Heritage, because the mission is, diff what differentiates it is that, that it's a journal where you can publish the 3D models, you can publish the technology. So up until the time when we did that, what you could do is give screenshots or renderings, still renderings that were 
you know, put on the printed page, but that was such a, a, a reduction to a bare minimum of what you actually were doing. And so we created this journal so that you actually can publish the Stellarium model or the Unity model or uh, the model as it's running in Sketchfab as is sort of the uh, Sampa models. And, uh, and that means that the, that the reader is empowered because it's not a, st a static image of a, of a model that's locked away in somebody's computer, but you have the interactive model and you can question what we've done and you can check it Check, uh, follow in our footsteps and, and check and see if we're right. And, or, or you can just develop new ideas and go off in a totally different direction. It can become a scholarly resource for you. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Bernie, let me take this in a different direction because the way you have articulated this, for example, bringing the Uffizi Gallery from Florence to Bloomington is great for people in Bloomington. But the potential is that it is a threat to the tourist industry of Florence. Under what circumstances are there issues here of intellectual property? Where I, an Italian government official, listening to you do this presentation, I would be on the phone back to Italy and say, we need to write laws to keep these, these things from happening. Well, it, I mean, it, you know, from an academic standpoint, we look at this and we say it's great. But from the standpoint of other stakeholders and other actors in this whole process, you're a threat. We have ways to be Right. Well, um, you know, I, I'm saying we're, we're doing the Uffizi project, but as I'm sitting here, the contract is not signed and fin even finished. It's very close. And we are supposed to start on May 16th, and everyone is optimistic we will, and there are no outstanding issues. But this has been negotiated for months, and they approached us, we didn't approach them, and there is a contract, and it, it has, uh, it's very clear about intellectual property. So that is a concern. And we never could, the tribunal, by the way, you can't get into the tribunal. The doorways are covered with bulletproof glass. They're, you can't go in inside. So it'll be, it'll take some work to take, dismount at least one set of, of glass in one doorway so we can get in and do our work. Um, as far as the other point about reducing tourism, this reminds me of um, the studies done a long time ago now, at least 10 years ago on the digitization of books and the publication of books in digital form on say Amazon's website as something you can browse before you buy the book. And it turned out that you know you might think, well people can read it for free um, digitally the American buy the printed book. But actually the fact that the digital version is free increases the sale of the printed books because first of all people find out about things that they wouldn't have uh, known even existed and they can try it and read a, a few pages. Most people still don't like, I, I've been reading things on, on the computer screen for decades, it doesn't bother me at all, but I think many people still prefer to read a printed book if they're going to read a book. But on the other hand, they can dip in and try it out and read the first couple pages and see if they really want to buy it. And it's much uh, easier to do that uh, you know, if you're living in the middle of the country and you don't have access to an enormous bookstore, of course, and they're, far, they're fewer and, far, far between and, and, and farther between because of Amazon in the first place. So um, I think the same thing will be true of virtual tourism, that it will increase people's awareness of the existence of places they otherwise never would have heard of, or details at places that they didn't see if they've ever been there, and make them want to go back. And because there's still nothing that's going to be a autopsy in the experience of actually being there. But your, your point is well taken, because you know uh, there are other cases where cultural agents involved in the digitization process can voice concerns that have to be acknowledged. So there's a case where SciArc digitized some Hopi petroglyphs, and it was a great concern to this tribe that um, if the geo-coordinates of this petroglyph site were given out, that there was going to be significant damage by non-Native American communities. And so the site was digitized and made available in a SciArc viewer online, uh, much like the Sketchfab viewer. Um, but the geo-coordinates aren't getting. So one can still go on and explore the, the reliefs, the petroglyphs carved into the rock, but, um, and the um, pictographs, the reliefs painted on the, the pictures painted on the rock, 
but you can't exactly know where they are. And that, of course, hinders some types of analysis because you can't, you can't study solstitial alignments, but you can do a lot with it. So your point is well taken. Okay, there was a question up here. Uh, hello. Um, are any of your 3D uh, modelings ever going, or do you know of anybody putting them into like a holographic form so people can view it in a three-dimensional way from like just digitally to, you know, in person? Uh, would you ever experience that, or have you ever experienced with that, or do you uh, know anybody working in that field? That's my question. Uh, Patty does, but uh, sure. do you want to know? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, I once was approached by a company in Texas that, that wanted uh, one of our Roman imperial statues so they could make uh, a hologram of it. And I think they did, but, and they were going to give it to me, and I never heard back from them, so I don't know whatever happened to that. But um, I, I really haven't had much experience with that. But have you, Patty? Um, actually, I have. Uh, three months ago, I was in the Cairo Museum, uh -huh. and one of the uh, more popular attractions is King Tut's Mask. Um, that is currently not on exhibit now because it's gone through some damage issues and whatever. Um, they, it was typically put on a pedestal kind of close to a wall where if it was really there, you could really only see the front of the mask. Because it wasn't there, they did a 3D holographic image of the mask and just it just spun, which, which was really wonderful because you can actually see more than if, if the real one was there. The way they had, it was fabulous. Um, I'm uh, just turning, uh, re uh, going back to school, and this is something of mine that I um, have an extreme amount of interest in. Um, real quick, do you know of any uh, any universities that are working on that that I could be looking into? I can find out. I will also look into it myself, and thank you for your time. Other question? Okay, you were. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on John's question and thank all of you. This is wonderful and um, incredibly stimulating and eye-opening. I, I was also very curious about this question that I now know to call care of data. Um, and, but what I'd love to hear more about is the, the discussions and then the perhaps solutions about how to communicate that visually. Um, so rather than the, the footnoting, that's, as it were, of um, how we know what or how secure and what degree of security we have for different elements are. Are there strategies that you've been working with or people are talking about to try to, you know, the equivalent of the dotted line versus the solid line on the architect architectural plan? Uh, there, there's a dissertation on this by a guy named Tori Zook at the uh, University of Calgary from a few years ago, which you can, you can probably get from ProQuest. And um, I'll give you the reference to it. And he works out across disciplines, but including, he has a chapter on archaeology, how you can do this uh, just uh, graphically and not using words. I personally believe you should do perhaps both ways. And the default should be words, but if you can do it graphically, um, why not? And just to give you some examples of, uh, of the schemes that have been used to convey uh, levels of certainty and uncertainty graphically. So if one scheme uses the uh, traffic light, so uh, green, yellow, and, and red. And green is totally certain, and yellow is be careful, be cautious, and, and red is be very careful because there's definitely a lot of guesswork going on. And so you can use color. Another thing has to do with um, sort of solidity. If something's very solid and there's no transparency, then it's solid, we, it's known, it's certain. And then you can make, you can add more and more transparency to the object uh, or parts of the object to show the uh, uncertainty of that part. It just kind of gets to be very gossamer-like. It's there, and it's outlined, and you have the contour, but you can't, it's not solid. So you can flag things in, in those kinds of ways. And Tori's a, a catalogs and so it tries to systematize, systematize the approaches that have been used across the fields, uh, not just archaeology, a lot of fields have this problem. Thank you, Han. Yes. Um, I was fascinated to see how you use the drones in, uh, in Mexico to, uh, you know, to take the pictures that you did. That was fantastic. And I wonder to what extent there's going to be a rush to sort of um, map out all of the wonderful archaeological positions globally, and I mean including in, in Asia and of course not Middle East is somewhat difficult, but of course, I mean, as opposed to things from, you know, satellite from space saying, oh, well, I think there's a lump over here outside of Jerusalem, so let's investigate it. But now actually going out there with the drone and with the, with the cameras and, and actually using, to what extent is this going to be 
Um, I guess that's directed to me. Um, so I can, for, I'll just start by the sort of how this developed. It happened very quickly. The consumer level drone really just appeared in the last five years, I would say, because I remember when I was in Konstanz in 2010-11, I went into a model airplane shop because uh, we were working at Hadrianville, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could get some sort of cheapo device to carry a camera across my site and take some pictures? And there really wasn't anything at that point. That's 2010-11. And then by 2012-13, they, these things like the DJI Phantom started to appear and the GoPro camera that attached to them with a gimbal that keeps it very uh, steady. Uh, so then, uh, looking at the main professional organization in this field, Computer Applications and Archaeology, in the annual meeting which was in, in 2013, which was in Paris, there was one poster on uh, photometric modeling using drones and, and the GoPro. And it was, uh, offered by uh, Benjamin uh, Duca at the University of Berlin. And luckily I saw that poster and talked to him, he was standing next to it, and he got me started. So I immediately bought a, a drone and a GoPro in uh, May of 2013, and then we started using it. The next CAA, which was in Siena in 2014, I think I'm off by one year, so Paris was 2014, Siena was 2015, about one third of the papers were about photogrammetric modeling using drones. There was a special session. There were, out of you know, 200 posters, at least 70 or 80 were about drone projects. So it really spread quickly in the professional community, uh, like wildfire. And so then, just to project ahead, you could easily imagine a kind of a YouTube where people could do these things and, and publish them online using service, some kind of web publication service. It could even be Sketchfab or the competitive services where, that publish 3D models and make them interactive. So hobbyists can do it. The one problem that we have, though, is that in the United States, because of the FAA regulations that came into effect last year, it's now very difficult to fly drones. You have to file a flight plan and get permission in advance, you have to, and, and when you file your flight plan, the FAA wants six weeks to respond. Uh, until that went into effect, which was February or March of last year, you could fly a drone uh, anywhere in the United States. It's now been banned in all national parks. Pardon? And banned in national parks. So the United States is uh, somehow clamping down on this, and I hope the other countries of the world aren't paying attention, at least for a while. <laughs> Um, in Italy, they're not paying attention. They have rules, but I think they're much more reasonable. You could fly a drone in an area with a very, uh, first of all, drones of under 25 pounds. Well, the, like our drone is five pounds. You don't need 25 pounds for most purposes. Um, so that's good. And you can fly it without any permission if, uh, if, if it's over an, uh, an area that's not populated. So you wouldn't fly it over the middle of Rome, that wouldn't be allowed. But you can fly it over Cosa, an archaeological site in the middle of nowhere where nobody lives. That's OK. Uh, I wish we had that in the United States. Um, so if the American law doesn't spread across the world, then I think we'll, that, that it'll be crowdsourced. We'll get a crowdsourced documentation of a, of a lot of cultural heritage, which will be a good thing. Since we're running late, um, we have time for one more question, Nick. I was the student that John mentioned that worked with Bernie at, at Horace's Villa in 1999, and we actually pioneered some early virtual reality techniques using QuickTime VR and a two megapixel camera. And at the time, it was state of the art, and it's amazing how far we've come. But I wanted to ask, and anyone on the panel can um, answer too, uh, about the sort of foibles that we might that might come from these digital reconstructions in that we can now alter any distance, height, or any variable in the reconstruction. And it gives us these sort of godlike powers that obviously the ancient Romans, for example, didn't have in constructing their monuments. So, I mean, I am guilty of this too in my own reconstructions of um, finding maybe alignments or um, things that might not be as important as they seem they are in the reconstruction. Does that make sense? That because you have the ability to see everything from every angle, you, you might see um, patterns, like, like in a beautiful mind, you know, when he's in the, in the, in the garage and he's <laughs> seeing patterns and numbers everywhere. 
So everything becomes like the Da Vinci Code? Yeah. And I feel like sometimes, you know, you might get latched on to something and then find like, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence that may support it, but it might not be as important as it actually is. Um, and if, if you can comment or anyone on the panel too can comment on um, that. That reminds me, um, a little job we had in the in Mexican archaeology some years ago, an archaeologist who felt it was his duty to correct the Mayan trace of a building because it appeared to him that it was wrong from the Mayans. So he did it physically. <laughs> and I, I simply can tell you he's not anymore in archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> because there is this factor of authenticity when we are dealing with monuments. So it doesn't matter what is the the mean for that, if it, if it is direct uh, physical techniques to repair a building, to restore a building, of, or it is uh, some 3D modeling that we, we have, still we have to deal with authenticity as one of the underpinnings of archaeology. So I, 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 don't, I don't see it as a problem um, to understand. I mean, uh, we can, we can, of course, we can try and do s different expressions, different uh, mo modeling for uh, hypothesis. That's what we do usually. You know, in the field we think about possibilities for this and that. That doesn't mean that that is true. We are always. Uh, um, working with something that is very valuable that we cannot alter, that is the physical evidence, that is, that is archaeology uh, about. So I think it is, it is possible, but still we have to remember ourselves that archaeology is based on authenticity. And I would just add, I think here we have to also bring in scholarly communication because if you're just making a model and you think you see something and uh, you make a website, let's say, that you just publish without peer review uh, on your own, then uh, you, know, you may or may not be right, you may be totally deceived. If on the other hand you submit the work to peer review and where the glory is to be critical and to show where the author is wrong, and where, in my experience, somebody, some reader always finds at least something to improve, then uh, before your crazy idea gets out there, it's passed through a very serious filter, and it, which may stop it if it's really crazy. And if it makes it through, then it has a fighting chance. And then, but if it's in a, pub, a serious scholarly journal, then they'll, that will only be the beginning. It'll have an afterlife, and people will write about it, react to it, and, and accept it, and build on it, or criticize it if they really think it's wrong. If, in the fullness of time, the craziness comes out, uh, but put it into the scholarly discourse. That's again why we started the journal. Let's regularize this activity and stop it from being this sort of boutique side cutesy thing that you know creates eye candy that people love, but um, but also can attract. Uh, uh, crazy people and their crazy theories, and who knows what's right or, or what's not right. Let's just normalize it, and I mean, that's always a question about how do we know that anybody's interpretation of Hamlet is, is correct or not, or, va or valid, or is it professionally uh, worth taking seriously, let's put it that way. Well, I think if they've gone through peer review and it comes out in a respectable journal that does that, you're more apt to take it seriously and read it, think about it, than if you just created a website and published it. Yeah, I like to always joke that I started off as an expert in art and ended up in a, as an expert in computer graphics. And I think one point you're making really clearly is that we always have to take into account contingencies. You know, uh, we might, our audience might not be aware that we set a camera six and a half feet off the floor. But that significantly alter, alters the way that we're asking someone to view a Renaissance painting versus five feet. And so one thing we might want to do with our pair data is say, what is the optimum or what, what is phenomenologically satisfactory and how is that being selected for? I mean, in, in my context, the aristocracy, which was significantly taller than the common people, had a different view of objects than other people. It's the same in the early modern world. And so I think we can use some of these contingencies to actually ask 
more important questions. And I think it informs a type of humanism in historical phenomenology and forensic reconstruction in a way that's really profound and exciting. Okay, well with those words, I think we will conclude our event for this evening, and I thank you very much.